Welcome to today's webinar, Digital Learning, Prepping for the School Year Ahead. I'm Emily Mulder, Program Director at the Family Online Safety Institute. And for those who might be attending an event of ours for the first time, we are an international nonprofit organization based in Washington, DC, working across the three key areas of public policy, digital parenting, and industry best practice to help make the online world a safer and more positive place. We wanted to convene this discussion today because back to school season is one of the pivotal times of year when it comes to kids and technology. And this can be for so many reasons. It's a time when parents and kids are often reestablishing what a balance with tech looks like as homework comes back into the routine. It might be the first year that a child is heading off to school with the responsibility of having their own phone or tablet. Um, it might be a year where kids start to experience some of the social dynamics that can come along with going to school in a highly connected environment and some of the highs and lows that can come with that growing sense of digital independence. Shout out to the middle schoolers and all the parents of middle schoolers. <laughs> Uh, those are just a, a few of an infinite number of scenarios, and in addition to all of that, uh, many of the headlines we're seeing right now have to do with brand new technologies like generative AI, which is something that we're all learning about and navigating in real time, and is a great example of how new tech will arrive, but our values and our approaches to tech, approaches to tech use can stay steady throughout. So we're aware that this is a moment where both kids and parents can use some support, benefit from some expert insights and perspective, and hopefully gain a sense of confidence heading into this school year. And in exploring that, we are very lucky to have the group assembled that we do today. Um, please keep in mind that we would love to hear from you. So do feel welcome to use the Q&A function to send in questions throughout the conversation for the panelists, um, whether you're a parent yourself, an educator, community leader, whatever background or point of view you're coming to this topic from, it would be great to know what the most pressing issues are for you. And lastly, a reminder that this session is being recorded and will be available in full on our YouTube channel. So we hope that you will revisit and share it with anyone who may benefit after today, it should be available by early next week. So with that, I will invite our speakers to turn their cameras on and hand things over to our wonderful moderator, Janelle Burley Hoffman, who is an author, a parenting expert, and a great longtime friend of ours here at BOCI uh, to introduce herself and get the panel started. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Emily, and thanks to everyone from the FOSI team. Um, thank you to everyone present for this live session. It's incredible that you've made this time wherever you are on planet Earth, whatever time zone um, that you're here, that you've made the priority to um, be part of this conversation, uh, to engage at this level. And if you're watching the playback, um, that's incredible as well that you found the time to intentionally um, think about young people and technology and back to school. And just <laughs> as a mother of five, I know what it means to carve out that time and, and really kind of continue your education in this way. And it's no small thing. So if, if this is your invitation of the day to congratulate yourself um, or thank yourself or show yourself some gratitude uh, for being present and showing up for, for the young people in your world, however that is, um, take that moment of appreciation um, because it's, again, it's no small thing. So my name is Janelle Burley Hoffman and I wrote the book, I Rules, What Every Tech Healthy Family Needs to Know. I speak and consult in a program called iRules Academy, which comes into schools and communities, families and organizations to talk about how we live tech healthy lives and digital health and well being, particularly of youth, but of, of family systems and communities as well. And so I, I don't want to wait another minute to introduce you to this brilliant panel. Um, so much rich information, so much wisdom here. Um, and, and so we'll just kind of pass it around. I, I would love for you to hear. Um, their point of view of, of their introduction and, and just kick us off in that way. So I'd, I'd love to start with Amanda, if that's okay, and, and have you uh, introduce yourself and, and welcome the group. And then we could kind of just pass it organically, however that works. Hi, um, hi everyone. So great to be here. Uh, my name is Amanda Latasha Armstrong. I'm a postdoctoral scholar with Digital Promise, which is a nonprofit that focuses on digital equity, technology, education, and really creating these kind of equitable systems within that. Before that, I was um, working at uh, the Learning Games Lab at New Mexico State University, where I was also getting my PhD in curriculum and instruction. And there I did um, a number of things, which included teaching design to kids, um, in after school and in, in summer session, um, 
also uh, being a part of design teams and doing user testing. And so really thinking about all the different ways that children interact with tech. And I was also a research fellow with New, Mer with New America doing some work in um, uh, culturally responsive education, OER, um, and really kind of thinking about how that connects to education policy. And I'll pass that on to Judy. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, my name is Judy French, and I'm representing PACER's National Bullying Prevention Center. Uh, PACER Center has been around since the late 70s, helping families of children with disabilities to navigate the public school system, and now much, much more over the last 46 years. Um, and during all of that time, we have been helping families and kids with bullying prevention as, as most of you know, uh, kids with disabilities are bullied at a rate of two to three times their peers without disabilities. So we have uh, three websites, and that's how the public knows us best, pacer.org slash bullying for adults, basically anyone intersecting with the life of a child and caring about what happens to that child. Um, it's not inappropriate for kids, but the vocab level is a bit higher, and it's where we archive everything but lots of information for teachers, educators, again, anybody caring for a child. And then PACER teensagainstbullying.org, which is for middle school and high school students, and PACER kidsagainstbullying.org for elementary school students. We get about a million and a half visits to those sites per year. And what we do is we take good research and turn it into content that anybody can access and use. Most of what we have is free and downloadable, and we want the public to come in and take a look at everything uh, because our mission really is to ensure that childhoods are free from bullying. That's what we're working towards, creating a world without bullying. And this year, our emphasis is really on creating more connected communities to create um, a safety net for kids, because it doesn't take just one person out there advocating for their child. It is a group effort. And so I'm so, so happy to be a part of this group today. I'm going to pass it on to Yella. Thank you. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, as well. My name is Yelda T. Ools. Um, I am a former media maker. I used to be in the film business, and then I got a PhD in developmental psychology at UCLA. I'm also a mom of two grown-up teens. They're still in the adolescence phase, and I'm an author. I wrote a book called Media Moms and Digital Dads, a fact, not fear approach to parenting in the digital age. Um, and I am a great believer in translating research so that it can be useful, which is why I founded the Center for Scholars and Storytellers at UCLA, where I'm on faculty. Um, and in that role, what we do, what I do and with my team is we work towards um, harnessing the power of entertainment media. So all the media your kids spend um, outside the 24-7 lifestyle of today's tweens, teens, and young adults. Um, all that media, we try to work with the people that are creating that media, and we try to get them to make it as positive a, an experience as possible. We work with YouTube, we work with Disney, we work with Warners, we work with many people. Um, and actually, Pacer's stuff is really great. We just worked with Disney on a, on a playbook um, that you'll we'll put the link in, which is about bullying. We basically curated um, a lot of incredible resources for many, many, many um, organizations um, in the U.S. And Pacer had very high quality content. Um, and it's it's we created three playbooks similar um, for parents who um, have have kids who are bullies, parents whose kids are bullies. And um, for people who want to be proactive um, in sort of trying to prevent bullying before it happened, um, and it's under choosekindnessproject.org. So um, I hope that resource is useful. We spent a lot of time trying to make it really, really easy and, you know, pulling together the best in class. And I'll hand it off to the wonderful Dr. Michael Preston. <laughs> Thanks, Yelda. And so uh, I feel so lucky to be here with all of you today. I'm really excited for what we're going to talk about. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm Michael Preston. Um, I've been in education technology for 
many decades at this point. Um, my training is uh, formally in cognitive psychology, but uh, professionally, I've been in software product development for learning in higher ed, but mostly I've worked in K-12 public education um, to try to bring technology into schools and put it in kids and educators' hands in ways that are transformational for learning and student-centered primarily. And so I've always thought of technology as the lever for that. Um, and uh, the, the last kind of big thing I worked on was the starting the, or helping to start um, the Computer Science for All movement in New York City schools and then helping to support that movement nationally. Um, but today I run a research and innovation lab at Sesame Workshop called the Joan Gans Cooney Center, which is named for the visionary creator of Sesame Street. Um, and in that capacity, we take kid-centered innovation and design methods from Sesame that Sesame's pioneered for more than 50 years and we help innovators today apply them to emerging media and technology. Um, we work through that with a wide range of, of individuals and organizations, um, startups and big tech companies to help them mobilize research, take, take up what we already know in their work, and also to include diverse kids in the design process so that the products they make have a positive impact and serve kids everywhere. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Um... If, if we were in person uh, to everyone in the audience, I'd, I'd have you give them a round of applause. So maybe just extend a, a moment of energetic gratitude um, for the way that these people show up every single day to, in the trenches to do the work of um, caring for young people, thinking about young people, researching, um, listening to young people. So um, we need you and your work. And thank you so much for making this time and your busy, busy lives to be here with us and to share your wisdom in that way. So, we see we have this rich community here today and and i'd love to hear what's going on specifically like that back to school season. Um, it's such a particular time in parenting in caregiving in education and in culture right there's so much going on and, and it was referenced at the top of the hour of. We all might come to this room today, having different experiences, you know, some of us might be. Um, caring for very young children who like, what's the right amount of balance between trying to work and trying to think about getting our, our child safe sites online, right? What's appropriate for that young mind? Um, what about the adolescent mind? Or what about a child who's getting into gaming or social gaming for the first time? Um, what about classroom technology and how that's ever changing every year and the pressure on educators to think about um, how they can continue their own education and meet the needs of students. So all of you might walk into this, this virtual room today with different needs. And, and so I'd be so curious um, to, to kind of start off going around in our circle to see what's on the hearts and minds of your community, of you or your community right now in this moment, in this back to school season, as it relates to um, the digital scope, um, the health and well-being of, of young people. So, so I'll start with Yelda, if you want to lead us in this space and just thinking, again, through that perspective of, of hearts and minds of you and your community and your work and research. Yeah, I mean, we, some of the things that we really think about is empowering youth as well um, and helping them because, you know, we focus on entertainment media. So the media that your child is is consuming outside of the classroom, even though it is the back to school or era, they will still be consuming a lot of media outside of the classroom. And what we try to do when we work with youth is we teach them how to um, lift their voices up to the people who are creating content for them. So that can be tech companies and it can be the people that create shows on Netflix, um, you know, so that because often in tech, it's actually they're starting to value team voices more. Um, but in traditional storytelling, they often don't include teen voices beyond sort of their own child or, or their memory. And we're trying to say, listen, today's youth are dealing with so much more than any of us had to deal with growing up. You know, I've heard it been described as two adolescents, although adolescents don't think of it as two separate worlds. The online world and the face-to-face in-person world are very entwined, um, but it is they have to learn different social norms. Um, and so we really try to empower young people, marginalized communities um, to say what they care about. This is the most diverse generation um, ever. And so we focus on authentically inclusive representation. We think about mental health. 
Um, we think about ways kids can take breaks from media, all sorts of things. Um, you know, and 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 I know we have so many different experts, um, and we'll be talking about sort of parenting takeaways because um, I have a lot of info information around that as well. So I'll hand it back to you and let you assign who speaks. <laughs> sure, I just wanted to ask a follow up because um, I think it's so interesting. If I if if I'm a young person, right? I, what is a way I let Netflix know what kind of content I want? Like, what is an actionable step there? I, you know, if I'm an educator and I work in a high school setting with teenagers, how do I tell them to use and lift their voice and amplify their voice to influence media? Honestly, there's no mechanism. We're trying to create a mechanism and a social cult a cultural. We're trying to shift the culture of Hollywood. Um, but we have a program, the Youth Media Representation Program. I'll get the link and put it in the chat um, or we'll share it later. Um, and it's a school year program where from September to um, the, basically during the school year, kids learn about how to speak to storytellers. You know, that's that was my career before I got the PhD. Writers, creators, they're they're incredibly talented and sensitive and and, you know, we want young people to be very productive and feel useful because um, there are things that storytellers um, feel defensive about. And if we can teach young people to really share share the what they think in a way that will land, we believe storytellers will incorporate it into their content. So our program teaches them that. And then in the summer piece of it, we also have a summer piece. We also teach them a little bit how to go back, research what more than just they think about around media. Um, so they do a little youth participation action research, basically, where they um, go back to their own communities and say, what would you like to see um, it, regarding mental health and a story? You know, what would resonate for you? And then we teach them in the school year how to share that with storytellers. Um, hopefully, if we achieve our mission, which adolescents will be considered seriously and be front and center um, for all creators of content for store, you know, for young people, um, in five, 10 years, there'll be a much more clear path to sharing their voice. I love that. Thank you. Judy, what about you? What's going on on your heart and mind and in your community? I, I absolutely love what Yelda just said, and I cannot wait to dig in and take a look at, at everything that she just was talking about because stories move the needle for kids all the way through. I was a former all school librarian. So I, I will completely love that. Um, but I, I, I want to just go back fundamentally to the role that that parents and, and those of us who care and work with children uh, have in their lives, um, something very fundamental, um, because I, I, I think we get very seduced by um, the glitz and the buzz and the hype around new technology. And I worry very much that sometimes that distracts us from the primary job um, of uh, helping kids navigate, you know, through the thorny path of puberty and adolescence and all those developmental stages to get them safely, you know, to a place where they can really use their own judgment. Uh, PACER is very, very big on helping parents learn to advocate for their children and advocate well. Uh, but then we're very, also very big on passing that along to the youth. Yeah, so that they learn self-advocacy, which I think is a piece of what Yelda was just talking about. Lift your voice up. You have something to say. You're not representing me well in this story. That's not what would happen. I love that. I love that piece because we're something like, you know, my, my little tide pool here is bullying, but where bullying takes the power away from kids, self-advocacy can give it back. So when I speak to adults, and I prefer to speak to adults before I ever speak to students, speak to a lot of faculty, staff, and parents, I tell them, you need to be a good landing pad for the stories that come to you, right? Because when kids come to you, especially with problems regarding technology and cyberbullying, they will not be coming back if what they hear is, I'm taking the technology away. That's the number one fear of kids when they want to talk about technology. Like, I'm going to take the phone away. I'm going to shut this social media down. And we can't 
do that really anymore. Uh, it, it's, it cuts kids off from their social life and such like that. So I would say to parents, you are basically doing the same job you were trying to do before in real life, uh, which is to keep the lines of communication open so you hear these stories. We're prevention people at PACER, and I am heart and soul a prevention person. I want to be ahead of it wherever possible. So communication, support, um, to engage youth to be safe and asking this one fundamental question, who are you gonna be online? Who are you gonna be when you're uh, connected to tech that connects you to the world? Are you the same person that you are in real life? And I ask that of the adults too, because again, it isn't just what we're promoting, you know, the ideals and the wisdom, which is what everyone thinks parenting is before they do it, right? But what we're modeling for kids in terms of our own use of technology. So those are the things that are on my heart and mind all of the time, actually, those fundamentals. Um, back to you. Thanks, Judy. I, I love that. There's so much I want to add. And I just kind of want to note in there where um, some of the, the perspective that I've seen in my work very related to what you were saying is this idea around um, because of the technology, perhaps parents are coming to understand child development in a way that maybe they wouldn't have thought about it if there wasn't this new shiny thing. So while I, I do believe sometimes it can be a hyper focus on that, I think underneath that, um, sometimes when I come together with a parent and caregiver community, I'm thinking, wow, what they're really asking questions about is like, is this appropriate, right? Is this like, whether it's developmentally or um, safety wise? And so it's like this, this attunement that's happening, I find sometimes with parents, while they might bring a lot of fear and anxiety, the moral panic to the room, it's actually this opportunity to introduce some of those foundational tools around communication, relationship, um, what is okay, right? Like those, all of a sudden your child gets uh, texting capabilities and their, their whole social life is their friends. And it's like, well, actually that's really appropriate for a 13 year old right? Regardless of screens or not. So, so I love that it in a lot of ways can also invite this uh, new approach, this new attunement that maybe wouldn't have been there because so many parents didn't grow up, you know, with the, the portable high speed technology in that way. So there's a and curiosity there. It, I want, yeah, any opportunity for conversation is a good one. And, and also to underscore the fact that the conversation need not be negative. Like I, I love to engage with kids when they're playing games, like at my friend's houses and they're playing something I can, any of the role player games are beyond me. Any of the Dungeons and Dragons type games are totally beyond. I just don't think that way. But I'm like, I always sit down with them. Show me what you're doing. You know, show me how it works. Uh, and oh, by the way, can you guys message each other in it? You know, like, show me how it works. Teach me how, what you love about this. Uh, so that that's a, that's a way to engage. So, you know, I'm thinking about that all the time. How do I engage when I know that my team does not want to talk about this. <laughs> What's the way to get in there? You know, I take, sure. take no prisoners. We're going to have a conversation. How do we do it? You know, so yeah. that's, again, thinking about all those things, we have communication. Yeah, and going on to their planet. I love that, Judy. Michael, what's on your heart and mind and the heart and mind of your research or your community? Um, wow. I mean, I, I love so much what Yelda and Judy already had to offer and this idea of elevating voices, whether it's in the media or their homes or in, in school settings. And so um, I hope we come back to that. Actually, I just thought maybe I would give a couple more things that are, are current for me that are uh, a little different. Um, I guess I'm sort of preoccupied with the opening of school because New York City public school kids, about a million of them went back to school today, which is a big deal and a relief for uh, parents everywhere. Um, but um, I guess from a heart and mind perspective, therefore, I'm thinking about supporting educators in schools. Um, this is a, a really hard time to be in education. And these are people who show up for kids every day, work really hard. Um, and it's it's a really big uphill battle around learning loss. If you're in education and if you read the news, if you read the education research, um, we lost devastating amounts of ground in math and reading and everybody's struggling to figure out how to do it pandemic um, funding is, is going to expire soon. What's going to happen? I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation and to lean into those challenges. Um, also, it's like extremely hot in classrooms right now. So it's a really hard time to be in classrooms. So everybody just keep keep educators in your mind. Maybe maybe folks are here um, in our audience uh, now or down, down the road, but uh, that's one. And then from my research community, um, it feels like media literacy is having a big moment right now. It's been, we've lived in a media literacy world, whether we're uh, aware of it or not for a while, but 
uh, when it's hard to imagine when our critical thinking skills have been more challenged than right now, the need to get some evidence, verify sources, you know, consider the source. Um, one of my favorite news examples this week is this new Gallup poll that you've probably seen that there's a 40 point gap. I mean, there's always been this gap, but there's a 40 point gap now between parents satisfaction with their children's schools versus public satisfaction with K-12 education generally. And so how do you reconcile those two things? The people who are, are in their school communities every day, whose kids are there, who are where it's very high stakes versus the sort of broader perception of where our system is going and why. And so what are the, just as a proposition, proposition for us to think about, like what do these data that we're seeing say about us and the media environment we live in? Um, never mind AI accelerating everybody's need to um, be very critically thinking about everything going forward. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about that today too. Yeah, that's great. We've already had a question come in about that. So we'll make sure to loop back uh, to answer that specifically. Um, thank you, Michael. And, and Amanda, your heart and mind. Yeah, I agree a lot with everyone was saying and, and just thinking about what Michael just said, um, you know, some of you know, one of the concerns is I spend my time in like the early childhood education world and then in the informal ed world. And so like, whereas with early childhood, there's like a little bit more hesitation. And so like, even though the pandemic kind of helped usher in some like new ways of thinking, and there was some, a lot of training and technical assistance to help support educators and families learning at home. It's just like kind of now figuring out what that means. Um, as well as with the new types of technology and emerging types of technology that have come and then in informal ed where there's a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more excitement about like things like VR, AR and such. And so um, when I think about, you know, helping to support people during, during that time or just thinking about what it means for going back to school, I think like looking at programs that maybe parents maybe wanted to their, their children to get involved in or maybe um, educators wanted to launch. And like learning their opportunities to maybe like be involved in those programs or um, you know connect with those organizations. For instance, um, in the Learning Games Lab, you know I'm no longer there, but they're still like holding sessions for youth during af after school time and out of school time, um, and in the summer that focus on game design, where they develop their like media literacy as well as their design skills and being able to like support like what they want to see in games and like getting them to design their own games. And like so, finding out those sorts of programs may have programs that are happening during the school year may um, also be helpful. And also, you can also maybe contact those organizations to find out what maybe technology that you can use at home. And then also from a, a, a different standpoint from just like the content that's allowed into classrooms. So thinking about the current policies. And so like right now, educators are figuring out what they can and can't teach. Families are learning what you know, what their children aren't like maybe learning about different cultural communities. And so like, this is kind of a time to kind of assess like, okay, what are the supplemental forms of, of information that I could find? And so like, for instance, um, some of the things I did when I was at New America was I would, for some, some, for some of the heritage, um, uh, communities within the states, like curating different resources that people can find that like maybe they can go to a virtual museum or maybe they can, um, you know, go to a talk or maybe there's some other kind of online content about different communities. So I think that like it's also a time where we're figuring out what you can actually do and teach and learn in class and like how can we help supplement those things um, that aren't available in the classrooms currently while people are figuring out policy. That's great. Um, a reflection of you. I'm, I'm just going to continue to hype you all up. Just a reflection of what's on your heart and mind is like a reflection of your work, a reflection of your reflection of your care. Um, so, so there's a lot there, and we could really tweeze out and go in a lot of directions. Um, and, and so, I just want to remind anyone who's in the live session that you can ask questions at any time, and we'll kind of filter them in. And as we segue into thinking about thinking about some cornerstones and some principles. Um, I do wanna read the question that's come in so far and then it'll, I think it'll lead us there. So the question is, how do you think AI like ChatGPT will be used by schools and kids this year? Um, what should parents and caregivers know about it or educators for that matter? So if someone wants to take this question and kind of answer it specifically, I, I invite you to do that. And then we'll kind of continue on as, because when I hear the conversation around ChatGTP um, or generative AI or anything like that, it's very similar um, to when about 10 years ago, um, devices started to be issued in school, one-to-one -one devices, right? It has a lot of parallels to me, like how do we move forward? How do we do this? How do we manage it? And I think collectively as a culture, um, 
we've agreed that um, educational technology, intentional use of technology can be incredibly beneficial to young people. Um, and while it still has, you know, a lot of challenges that way, I think we've just started to accept that kind of post pandemic, like where we had to adopt it. And now we're saying, oh my goodness, here's this whole new thing. Educators, parents, students, young people um, have to layer on top of that, which is, which is the conversation around AI. So if anyone wants to get specific and think about what do you think, what's kind of your prediction of how this will be used in education and personal lives? And, and then we'll kind of continue from there. I'm happy to jump in, even though I'm not an AI expert, but um, I think that one of the things, I mean, honestly, I do think just like you just said, Janelle, that this is very similar to things you know, in the in my book, I talk about at the turn of the century and end of the 18, 1800s, you know, the media that parents were most worried about were books. So we continuously feel, and now, of course, everybody's like, please read a book, kid. Um, so we continuously have these conversations and then we adapt. And and so the, the advice I would give for parents around chat GBT is the same I would give for every other technology. Get familiar with it yourself. Have you used it? Um, use it with your kids, taking a page from um, Judy, you know, sit down with them, you know, use it with them. Try to get those critical thinking skills going. How can you use this to learn more, not to replace and cheat on a test or not to like do your essay for you, but how can you use it to um, take something that you're already doing and improve it and, and build upon it? And, and I do know that there are some really top universities in the country that are thinking that way. They are thinking, okay, it's there. I mean, I'm at UCLA. We get emails all the time about like, how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to, you know, make sure we, you, that, you know, kids aren't cheating. And that is certainly a, a key piece to what we need to do. But ultimately where we need to get to, because it's here and it's going to continue to go, how can we make sure that we maximize the positive and minimize the harm by, and the best way to do that is to have open communication with your child get to know the technology yourself, and then learn from them and help them just like you would do in the um, typical parenting way, help them um, use it to support their learning and growth. And um, I really uh, liked what uh, Judy had said about um, parents. Um, about, sorry, sorry, I spaced out about what I was going to say. So I'm going to stop there and hand it off. <laughs> So I love it, the, the curiosity and the connection, those are kind of some through points with this new technology. Um, I love that. Other specifics and prediction, what do you think it will look like in, Michael, what do you think it might look like in a uh, public classroom this year, in a public school classroom? Great question. And you know, here in New York, it was banned brief, briefly uh, when it first launched, I think out of uh, kind of a natural knee-jerk reaction to fe you know fear it's like what does this mean you know we have to understand it we have to have a policy we need to regulate it what will kids do with it you know like like any sort of new and emerging technology there's a lot of like there's a, a gamut of you know excited speculation and experimentation to just pulling back right a natural reaction and uh yell i like your reference to sort of turn of the century thinking every time there's something transformational that arrives there's a, there's sort of a a range of reactions. Um, I do, there's a, the, I like the intergenerational approach for every media genre you can come up with. And certainly this is the one I often ask um, when I encounter young people or, or adults, like, have you tried generative AI yet? And, and I'm surprised actually at how many people say no. Um, I, it's like, why wouldn't you play with the new thing and see what it can do, you know? Um, but uh, I think it's helpful to think of what it's good for and what it's not. That's a really great conversation you can have in classrooms, in New York City public school classrooms or anywhere, uh, as well as at home. You know, we know it's really good for brainstorming, coming up with lists of, of things, you know, helping you get the creative juices flowing. It's good at summarizing. It's good at synthesizing. Um, there's a lot of power there that can maybe simplify activities that could be cumbersome and time consuming for, for students and other learners. Um, but you also have to be mindful of what it's not good for. It's bad at reasoning. It's bad at math. So 
it's full of bias. We know that the set of data on which the, the large language model, the data on which the AI is trained is gonna dictate what kind of answers it can give you. And there's a lot of bias in the data we have in the world, or it's not current. It's, you know, GPT is data is a couple of years old right now. So be ready for, you know, I, I said at the very beginning, you know, it's like, there's never been more need for critical thinking, like this is it. Um, you have to be very vigilant, but also keep it student-centered. I think these are, this is where, I think the fears, the natural fears over plagiarism and sort of replacing typical forms of, of like student work and assessment, or, or there, there's there's something to be said for that, but there's also what what's the potential for growth where you can really lean into helping kids understand this new world. Um, the, mo the metaphor that I like the most for AI right now is co-pilot. It's not going to replace you and your work. You, We as people offer something unique that only we can do. Um, computers uh, can help us do lots of other stuff. So what's the what's the relationship, and how do we how do we leverage leverage the new tech for good? Great, Amanda. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, and I, I love what both of you all were saying. And I was thinking about um, you know kind of what we would do in our learning games lab sessions is like we would have send we would have these guided conversations with kids, and then we would like send families um, questions that we would ask them that they can talk about the technology. So, you know, keeping that going is, you know, really important. And also just think leaning into the humanness. I, you know, I really kind of like what, you know, kind of Michael uh, was, you know, kind of alluding to, which is that sense of like, we're also people and persons and, and chat GPT isn't a person. So what are those other facets that we need to think about developing for children, like social, emotional, um, learning, um, like a critical thinking, I think also thinking about there's already tools that are media literacy related that have helped to think about, you know, how to look at online systems, like how to help compare information, which were actually, you know, which was done in like magazines and books, like we've done that. And I think chat GPT and with generative AI, we have that opportunity to do that as well, where we can really kind of use these sort of comparison skills to be able to look at different sources and really look Look at what's already been done with like media literacy and digital literacy and then think about how we can use that and then this context and and what's really been exciting for me is like working with a group like digital promise where they're really trying to think about and trying to think about different ways in which ai can be integrated and how we can use it to help support you know the overall growth and like really like build on what we already know about teaching and learning practices with technology and also just teaching practice in general and then think about what's different and then maybe what and what's similar with uh, generative AI. And can I just say one thing? Um, you know, Judy said uh, Dungeons and Dragons. This might have been what I was thinking about. Dungeons and Dragons was really hard. Same for me. Like I can't play any of these video games. ChatGPT is really easy. It is so easy. So anyone who's scared or thinks, oh my God, I just don't have the time, just put in chat GPT. You'll pull it up. You just put in a question and it will, I mean, I use it now a lot. So if I can use it, you can. <laughs> can, I, can I just add too that, that there's a lot of um, hesitancy um, by adults to engage in these conversations. When I go out to present on bullying and cyberbullying, for bullying, I know that the, some of the lenses that are in place are, oh, you know, bullying made me the man I am today. Bullying makes you stronger. Uh, you know, if you survive it, you know, you're going to be better for it. That those are for face to face bullying. People have lots of preconceptions, lots of myths and and very unhelpful things that they're carrying, you know, from their childhood. When it comes to cyberbullying, people are, you know, parents are tend to be kind of terrified about it, but they also tend to be very hands-off. So I had a recent, I had a series of conversations preparing for today with parents. And one in particular really stuck in my head, which is a parent who's very, very disciplined in her parenting, very directive, very um, authority-minded. And I said to her, so, so her child is, uh, she's a fifth grader and a kindergartner. And so I said, oh, good. So I said, what kind of conversations are you having about technology? And I know she, I've seen her parent or kid. She is very hands-on. And she said, well, nothing, nothing. She's not having the conversation. It's the one area that and sex education that I find that parents are very hands-off. They are hoping desperately someone else is doing it very often. 
but it's not happening in a lot of homes. And so um, her kids are allowed to have a half an hour of technology or an hour in the morning when she's sleeping. And so they are everywhere. They have no parental controls on it or anything. But at school, they do. So she's happy to know that that's happening there. But having a conversation, she's like, I don't know. So those conversations, you know, we can have a, a lot of great ideas about doing it, but, but you really do need to sit down and do it. And, and to me, the, one of the most powerful things is as an adult working with kids or parenting is to say, I don't know. I don't know. But you're not alone. We're going to figure it out together. Yeah. So that's just something I wanted to add in there. And I, I want to point out the, the Eldest Center published this great um, report with um, tip sheets for parents on uh, supporting the well being of youth in their use of digital media um, that I cannot remember the exact title of, but it, this, it was an analysis of kids and families and really showed how family engaged adolescents fared so much better because their families were engaged. This actually goes to the um, the question that just came in while we were talking about how to keep up with everything. I think that goes together that it, it unfortunately, you know, parents are busy and overwhelmed and tired. I, I can relate, but it also, there's this, the, the imperative of really getting to know what, what your kids' lives are like in these spaces and learn how to learn what they are for yourself. And just to add, yes, thank you, Michael. I just put the link in the chat um, and we do have a tip sheet for, for parents in there. And it, you know, I was not the lead author. Dr. Megan Moreno led it, and she is um, actually um, the lead of the American Academy of Pediatrics um, Center for Excellence on Social Media um, and um, Adolescence. So she really is, you know, a very um, accomplished and and knowledgeable source. And um, it was a really good study, and what it just really pointed out to that question about being overwhelmed with all that I was, I'm right there with you. I have been overwhelmed, you know, all of us, anybody who's tried to um, care for a child's digital world, there's just, it's impossible. So some of the things, and to Judy's point, just, you know, really having those conversations, being confident about your parenting skills, anything you apply to offline will apply online. And if you talk about, you know, the weight who you want to be in that media world? How do you want to come across? You know, you know, what are the just just having these open conversations and and talking to children about what they think? Um, you know, that allows them to teach you, but then you can insert your wisdom in there about just you know because you have a lot more life experience that you can share. Um, it's not about knowing every single app. Like that's actually literally impossible, even though there are services out there. It's more about thinking about the kinds of kinds of things that they're doing. And, you know, as, as uh, Michael said, you know, being engaged, this tip sheet, we found that content's way more important than time. Talk to them about what they're doing. That half hour with no rules, they could be on anything. Talk to them about the content. Don't worry about the time because there's really good content out there and there's not so good content. Um, anyway, there, there are plenty of findings in that study that I think really resonate with parenting and all the years of research that people have um, done a, about this world. And, 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 you know, and thinking about that from an educator standpoint, from points that all of you are making, you know, from teaching them um, in the summer when we were talking about games, actually, even though I would play games and play through them and we have guided conversations, they would discover things that I didn't notice or I didn't think about. And I mean, it was like, oh, you can do this. And then we would just, I will just be like, I mean, like it's just a constant kind of learning um, experience. And so I think like, you know, not giving, giving myself permission to not know has been, is really helpful. And to to like let them lead um in real time authentically like not like oh i'm pretending not to know this but it's like i didn't or if we're doing design and i know a tool really well and i think i know all this and then they're saying like they're they're working on wireframing and designing a wireframe of a, they, of a game that they're making and i'm and they're asking me a question that i didn't even think of and then they're working in groups i was like well what do you all think and they'll like pass it to them 
and they figure it out. And so like, that's some way to get to learn. And also like having communities, like for me, having like back to school time, this is the kind of time where everyone um, in at least the field are starting to like have a schedule, have a routine. It's a good time for, uh, for me to at least, or for others to build community around different topics, just to even like keep me on, um, keep me accountable for myself for saying like, oh, I was going to play with this tool or look at this tool and discuss it with folks and what they're doing. And so like that usually helps me just to keep to task when I'm when I'm learning about things, because I know I'm not going to learn everything and I don't plan to learn everything, but I do I do like to be a learner. And so I think like learning in community is really helpful. And I love this, and I and I hope that um, the audience and participants can really hear what's being synthesized here. Um, one of our missions when we had kind of the pre-panel meeting and we were thinking about today was just the acknowledgement and the validation that this conversation, technology, parenting, parenting today, it is naturally overwhelming, right? That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. <laughs> that doesn't mean um, that you you have to go do this whole overhaul of everything that's happening at home or at school or figuring out you know, apps at school, apps at home, what's going on? What are other people allowing? But we actually wanted everyone uh, to leave with that feeling of empowerment and reassurance. And I think uh, I just want to note some of the things that we've heard come through today in the conversation, which is building community, right? Um, building connection, whether it's with our child, with our child's school community, with um, other resources for our child, other parents and caregivers in our community. Um, curiosity, right? Curiosity about how does something work? Right? Let me get to know it. Let me increase my own digital fluency and media literacy in this way. But then also let me be a student to my child or to my own student. Right? Let, let me have um, some parallel time where it's like, what is it like to be you? Right? And can you show me that? And how does that work? Or, and really I'm saying, wow, you're really good at this. Or wow, you just taught me something. I had no idea. And, and this can be in the very young child. Right? This could be with the child on your lap figuring out you know, uh, a YouTube video or laughing together and building that connection. So for me, um, as, a, as a parent of five children, it's so important at moments that I had tools to ground myself when everything felt new all the time, or even the way one child would interface with something was entirely different than how another child did, right? And, and so just saying, um, what do I know? What, you know, coming from that strengths-based approach of what do I do well already? And what do I know really works away from the screen? Right, like we talked about, and how do I apply some of those values, some of those cornerstones and principles um, to life on the screen or to the digital world? And so again, just taking this moment, you know, chat GPTP next, we could do this webinar same time, same place next year, and it might be something totally different or way more enhanced or way more um, accepted or, or used, but there's some intangibles and some things that are unchanging that we can always go back to. And, and that's what I love about this group is that was really present in all of our conversations leading up to that. And, and so you have that already, just the fact that you're here watching this um, live or in the playback shows that level of engagement and that level of care. Um, can I just and, say one thing? Yeah, you know, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanna, I don't wanna forget because it's something that everybody sure. has said uh, and something that I really feel strongly about too. Um, getting the input of youth in the solutions you know, in the agreement that you might have. And I know you've done a lot of work on agreements uh, with kids around media safety and whatever, but having their input and that too, from an early age, what would you like to have happen if you're suffering, you know, through bullying or whatever, what would you like to see? You know, what would it, would it be like if it were better? Okay, if you're using technology and it's going well, what does that look like? You know, and having them put their input in there means that you have a greater chance for success going forward. And then revisiting that agreement as they mature um, often. So I, anyways, I just wanted to throw that in because it's, it's also kind of consistent through all of us. Um, you know, their input, critically important, lifting their voice up and authentically uh, with equity in the solution creation. I love that. And Yelda, you brought that right up right as we started the conversation of, of how do we amplify student voice or amplify our own voice. And so I think that's a nice place for us too, because we've thought a lot about the pressure on parents, the pressure on educators, it's ever changing. And how do we shift that? How do we engage students so that they feel that sense of empowerment as well? And they feel heard. Um, does anyone want to jump in and talk about student voice or youth voice? I'll jump in. Um... Well, first I wanna say thank you, Amanda, for continuously bringing youth voice directly into our conversation here. We don't have any young people here. I'm far from a young person, but the, uh, the we're talking a lot about them. 
Um, and, you know, increasingly we try to have these conversations with them in the room. And it kind of, what I see is cross-cutting in all four of our, or five of our uh, shared experiences here is this idea of like disrupting who's the authority uh, on, you know, their, you know, experts of their own experience, you might say, is this, uh, this that there's unique knowledge that kids can provide that and there's room to acknowledge it and give kids the floor. I mean, I, I mentioned the computer science work I did previously. One of the hardest parts of that was not like figuring out the curriculum. It was convincing teachers who are used to being the the uh, the most knowledgeable person in the room to accept that they were no longer deeply knowledgeable about the subject matter. And in fact, many of the kids in the room might know more. And then it created this much more democratic environment for learning where anybody could be the teacher, anybody could be the learner, and it actually was better for everybody. And so that's a model, that's something to think about, but in other spaces at home where the kids can show you what they know and can do um, or introduce you to new things that you didn't know about because they discovered it, like that's actually a really awesome thing to have happen. And so whether, and, and at the Coney Center, we basically work with work with producers of, of new media and, and technology and we have the kids in the room is invaluable. So I think there's lots of places you can think about that. And so maybe a message for our audience today is how, how can kids show up in your work um, and how can they make it better? I yeah. love that. And, and, oh, I'm sorry, Amanda. Um, I, I love that. And I think that's critically important, but I also wanna say that that doesn't mean there's no place for adults. And and I think it's really, cause sometimes, you know, when you have a teen, you're sort of like, really? But, but the reality is we're scaffolding them, we're helping them, um, but we're bringing their lived experience. We talk about lived experience all the time, but we never talk about adolescent lived experience, talk about different identity groups. Um, and so how do you bring their lived experience to the conversation? And then I also wanted to just quickly say, um, and I wanna, and then I'll hand it off to Amanda. And I think this speaks to the two other questions that are in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, I really loved sort of thinking about, you know, now that we have these tools to do so many things that when we were growing up, we didn't have those tools. You know, we had calculators, but, you know, way back when they didn't have calculators and they'd have to do everything by hand. When I was getting my PhD, I had this statistical program, but I had to learn all the underlying stat stuff that people used to do by hand. These things are less and less important. Social and emotional learning and critical thinking, those two things are critical um, for all of us to learn. They're critical in parenting and they're critical in the classroom. And if we can focus more on those skill sets, um, critical thinking in particular, because that's the thing we're bringing to the table that computers can't and social and emotional learning, that's the part that means being human, that robots are never going to learn fingers crossed, um, that, uh, that, you know, is more important than ever. And it speaks to everything we're doing. And to bring those two things together. So um, one thing that I'm finishing um, working with the Learning Games Lab on is like actually launching the toolkit about these activities that I'm kind of, that I keep talking about. But I mean, I think both of you all point to the point of like one building the trust, like uh, you know, for us, it's like setting guidelines, community guidelines collectively across about how we're going to treat each other, how we're going to um, use the technology and really kind of saying that as a basis and consistently revisiting that. Um, also, when you're talking about scaffolding those experiences, so do, in, incorporating lived experience reflection. So like having to think about things they care about while they're playing games, while they're also reflecting on different types of gaming topics or different media topics. Like that's another way of like incorporating both that their lived experience as well as looking at the media itself. I will also say um, like Bell, like reading Bell Hooks, Audrey Lord and Patricia Hill Collins were really helpful for me to figure out how do I decenter myself as an educator um, in different spaces, which comes to like our body language, to like how you're standing, who like really like I'm, if I think about myself really as a facilitator and a moderator, then like the dynamics of like, I'm really kind of helping support and going back to that scaffolding, sharing information. Cause yes, I do have information and they're, and they're sometimes there for the information that I want to share. And then like sharing that information and letting them have ownership of that and being like, what do I now do with all this information? And I, the other thing is like thinking about different ways to make sure that they're seen. So if you if you approach from culturally responsive education or just, you know, making sure that children are reflected, that see their communities as well as they're learning about other folks 
um, within the different kinds of media or technology experiences that you have. And then like thinking about ways of bringing in different modalities. So like thinking about how are you presenting information, like that's audio, that's, you know, written, that's visual, just different ways, which if you want to use something like universal design for learning as a framework, or like maybe something, uh, something else, but just thinking about different ways that, that youth can enter into like interest in technology and media. And so like, that's also something um, that's also to consider. So those are just different, like practical ways of thinking about how can I do that in my day-to-day -day practice that can help, that can help integrate technology, like children's like use voice authentically where and facilitate like them really like owning this and like being in and in, in creating how they are like in um day-to-day -day practice that's thank you for that and all of these great answers i know we're coming up on our time and i think i kind of want to merge the last two questions and also give everyone kind of in answering this a uh, uh, moment to just kind of have a final word with the group um and I'm thinking about these two questions are about um, digital citizenship, media literacy curriculum in the classroom, and also how do parents and teachers kind of collaborate. And these are really rooted in community connection and helping us feel less isolated that we're all on the same team, right? Or that there's a lot of support and that, that we aren't alone in taking this on, right? I think that's really important, whether it's formal education through a curriculum or informal education through talking to another parent at up in the morning saying hey are you allowing your kid to get a phone or you know how, how was did you were you able to figure out that app that they were supposed to submit their homework on like that's that's community right that's community we need each other in that way and so um just in terms of closing remarks thinking about um how do we lean on each other and how do we learn from each other um in this world where we might feel isolated or we might feel behind or we might feel overwhelmed and and kind of leaving everybody with that opportunity to think about um expanding their connection as it relates to uh, digital health and well-being, specifically in the back to school season, but always. And Judy, if you wanna lead us, that'd be great. Sure. Um, well, you just actually brought up something that I had wanted to say, which is one of the go-to messages that we have for kids when they're going through something difficult like bullying is, I'm here with you, you are not alone. I don't exactly know what we're gonna do, but I'm gonna figure it out. We're gonna figure it out together. And so it's a tricky step with kids, but for you yourself as an adult, we're not alone. You know, we should be enlisting the community and a connected community, a more connected community does not allow certain negative behaviors to flourish because the community members shut them down. And I used to think that this was just a fairy tale, but I have spoken to so many administrators and teachers at schools where, the kids have taken it on themselves because they've been, you know, positive social behaviors have been promoted and modeled by the adults, right? So it's a community-wide approach and there's research to support that as well. It's a very layered approach. All the community members have a role to play. So as a parent, you're not alone. As an educator, you're not alone. We need to reach out, figure out what is working. If we cannot interact with a child successfully, there probably is an adult who can. And by the way, to all the adults out there, you may be the adult for a child that is not yours. Uh, and you can help guide them through with all this tremendous wisdom that um, the other panelists have given today. Uh, your child may be speaking to a coach or a neighbor or a counselor or a teacher at school. Um, enlist them. Don't feel as though that's poaching on your territory. Be happy for that interaction if it's healthy and a two-way interaction there. Be happy that you're being supported. So enlisting the community and doing whatever you can to strengthen the connections throughout your community uh, to, to help create that safety net for kids. They're going to need it. We need it too. So that's where I'm at. Thanks, Judy. Amanda, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, from a like community, from a peer perspective, so I think about being really intentional about um, the folks that you interact with. So for instance, for me, the director of the Learning Games Lab, Barbara Chamberlain, was really supportive in helping me like merge my my background and my focus in early childhood and informal ed into like, what does that mean in the game design space and game learning space and really kind of supporting that 
and and then you know with digital promise they have a you know a, a different kind of take you know where they're looking at technology in general and then there's still that like really intentional dialogue about like what does this mean for education how do we support what we already know and so you know being really intentional about, about the community that we cultivate and the people that we work with is really important and then also from a um, relationship standpoint with teachers and families for me like relationships um, with families were important. So um, as from an educator, thinking about ways to like build those opportunities for like even like a few minute conversations during pickup drop off, like or any sort of time you may see them can really help like just build rapport over time and having those increments and making sure like to have that communication, like where you're sharing what you know you're learning, what their their kids are going through, creating ways to help them have conversations at home about what they're learning. So just different ways of also bridging that connection is helpful. Great, thank you, Michael. I'm not sure I, I can. Have to, I have to jump. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's fine. Do you want to parting words from leave you, us Yelly? with the closing? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just gonna us. say, uh, repeat what Janelle said in the beginning. If you're here, you're doing already probably a great job, and if you listen to this, you're doing a great job. Trust yourself. Trust your instincts. Trust that the parenting that you are um, so involved with in the offline world can be applied to the digital world. Um, you're doing a great job. So thank you all. You're thank all you for great. that. Bye. <laughs> and Michael, do you want to close us up? I don't know if I can improve on what folks have already said, <laughs> but I, I, it was, I, I loved it all. Um, I, I want to steal from Anya Kamenetz, who, um, who stole from Mark Bittman, I think, about how to enjoy food by thinking, substituting media, like enjoy, you know, enjoy it in moderation with people that 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 think about how it can be a joyful and purposeful experience for you and that it can draw you closer to other people beautiful and and thank you everyone for being here for your thoughtful questions um, for your shared wisdom and for just being in community today and to the entire hosi community thanks for holding space for this and it's it's been wonderful so good luck everybody and keep going thanks for having us <laughs>